Well, good evening. Good to see you all here. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Randy Wyckoff, the Dean of the College of Public Health, and one of the co-sponsors of tonight's event. Uh, this is the third Health, Equity, and Inclusion lecture. Um, and this is part of the Leading Voices in Public Health lecture series, which goes back to 2007. And the idea behind the series was to bring people in from around the country and around the world to, to both educate us and challenge us and help us see problems in a different light. And over the years, it became clear that there are several themes in leading voices, and several themes in improving health, and one is health and equity and inclusion. And that really led to the creation of this, of this series that we co-sponsor uh, with Dr. Keith Johnson in the Office of Equity and, and Inclusion. And so Dr. Johnson's gonna come up and introduce our speaker. I got to introduce the series. So Keith, it's, uh, it's here, here for you. You all saw Randy set the standard here. He didn't use the steps. He just kind of <laughs> glided up on the edge there. So I'm trying to follow his lead here. Uh, it's really an honor and, and really a pleasure for me to introduce our, our guest speaker tonight. I must say she's very impressive. Uh, and so you're going to get the foreshortened version of her bio. Because if I give her, if I give you her full bio, it's going to be longer than her presentation tonight. And so I want to make sure that at some point I want you to go back online and I want you to read her full bio so that you can see those impressive things and the impacts that she's made throughout this country. So Dr. Gail Christopher is an award-winning social change agent and um, with expertise in the social uh, determinants of health and well-being and in related public policies. She is known for her pioneering work in infused holistic health and diversity concepts into public sector programs and policy disclosure. In her role as the senior advisor and vice president at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, she was the driving force behind the American Healing Initiative and the Truth Racial Healing and Transformation effort. Dr. Christopher also served as Kellogg's Vice President for Programs. In 2015, she received the, the Terrence uh, Kanan Award from Grant Makers in Health. She chairs the Board of the Trust for America's Health. In 2019, Dr. Christopher became the Executive Director of the National Collaborative for Health Equity. Over the last 10 years, she has had responsibilities for several other areas of foundation programming. These areas include food, health and well-being, leadership, public policy, community engagement, and place-based funding in New Orleans and New Mexico. In August of 2017, Dr. Christopher devoted more time to writing and speaking on issues of health, racial healing, and the human capacity for caring. She is currently chair of the board of the Trust for America's Health. Dr. Christopher is also a nationally recognized leader in health policy with particular expertise and experience in integrative health and medicine, social determinants, and health, health inequalities, and health policy issues of concern to our nation's future. Her distinguished career and contributions to public service were honored in 1996 when she was elected as a fellow for the National Academy for Public Administration. In 2007, she received the Leadership Award for the Health Brain Trust for the Congressional Black Caucus for her work in reducing racial and ethnic health disparities. Over her career, she has received countless awards for her tremendous works. Of the many accolades Dr. Christopher has been noted for, she has also launched, led, and managed three public commissions under the sponsorship of the landmark, uh, Delmas Commission Research into Conditions Faced by Young Men of Color, Produce Policy Recommendations to Reduce Racial and Ethnic Health Disparities. Dr. Christopher holds a doctorate in neuropathy degree from the Chicago National College of Neuropathy in Illinois and completed advanced study in an interdisciplinary PhD program in holistic health 
and clinical nutrition at the Union for Experimenting Colleges and Universities at the Union Graduate School in Cincinnati. Please help me to provide a warm welcome to Dr. Gail Christopher. for that warm, gracious introduction. And you all will note that I took the stairs. <laughs> I'm not trying to prove anything tonight. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here, honored to be here. I've met so many of you in our meet and greet session, and I, I would love to have more time to hear from each of you, which I hope I will as the evening unfolds. We are going to have a little Q&A, or, or you know, we used to call it call and response, right, in the black church, but definitely do engage with me, if you will. Um, let me say that as my bio was being read, I was reminded of the privilege of being at a major foundation in this country. And it is truly a privilege to be able to distribute resources to help people do what they know needs to be done. And, and that was the philosophy of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, is to give the money to people in communities so that they could work to change their own lives. And truly, it was a learning experience for me, one that I will forever be indebted to the foundation for. Uh, it's inspiring to get to see what people can do, sometimes with just a few resources. Uh, and they take charge, and we take charge and change our lives. Uh, I try to bring good news whenever I speak. And I'm going to start my presentation tonight with some good news. And before I show the first slide, let me give you a little context for it. Uh, I am an NPR junkie. I don't know how many of you listen to public radio. I do all the time, and although lately I really need to listen to something about gardening instead because it's really hard, you know. <laughs> but, but as they give their poll results, you know, I kept hearing them priming, the, the poll questions were priming our polarization. The poll questions were things like, do you believe immigrants are a threat to America? You know, and I kept hearing it would be Pew Charitable Trusts or New York Times or NPR Mayor's Poll, and I said, enough, right? I thought, well, if you feed these questions, you're going to get these answers, and you're only going to amplify the negative energy that's dividing our society. So I decided, which has been the story of my life, right? If I see a problem and nobody's trying to solve it, I will try to do that, right? So we hired a polling firm, a savvy political polling firm. It happened to be the same firm that the Obama campaign used way back then. And we spent the first few months doing a landscape analysis of the various polls that were out there, because we had to see, was I totally crazy in suggesting that we could use different kinds of questions and maybe get different answers, right? So, but the initial research showed us that there were a lot of polls out there that were in fact showing not polarization, not division, not hatred, but actually the spirit, the heart of this country that wants democracy to work. But these polls were not being talked about in the news. So that gave us the courage to have them design a survey for us that we're gonna do annually at the National Collaborative for Health and Equity, which I serve as executive director of. We're going to annually survey, and we're calling this the Heart of America survey. And so I'm going to give you a few highlights from the result of that first one. You can go to our website, and we'll make sure you have access to it. And you can you know, dig into the weeds. You can do the cross-tab analysis. You can see what the country with the representative sample, and in some cases, we oversampled where we needed to to get more diverse voices, 
But it really did surprise us in terms of how much, how much optimism and how much heart there is in this country. And so even though the voices of polarization are the loudest, and even though it's very profitable to amplify those voices, they are not the truth. Okay, so let's look at the first slide. Did I get in the middle of it? Okay. All right. So the first thing, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but 31%, and that's a third, okay, almost, right? believe that relational work is critically important to our developing the capacity to see ourselves, one another, through a lens of our shared humanity. Now, who asked that question on a poll, right? <laughs> but we chose to ask that question because people are doing this work around the country. They are doing relational work. They are working across differences to bring people together. And it's happening largely through the, the gifts and the, the grant support from multiple foundations. And it is becoming a critical mass. For the last seven years, there has been a national day of racial healing every year. It follows the Martin Luther King Day celebration. So people are beginning to understand the core principles, the work that's required for developing the capacity for empathy and for compassion. And 31% of, of those respondents, they actually think that kind of work is important. They also think it's important for us to do that, to develop the capacity to see ourselves in one another, which is what racial healing is about. The other thing that was really exciting, especially given the recent um, decision by our extreme, I mean Supreme Court, <laughs> that negated affirmative action, right? They said eight out of the 10 respondents they really support diversity in the workplace so that diff people can work together across their differences. And wait for it, they also believe that teaching about racism is a critically important first step. Now you don't hear that on either of the cable news channels. It used to be either, now they're multiple. But you don't hear about this, this palpable readiness in our society for progress. And then, and this one really flies in the face of recent poll data. 88% would support a leader who unites rather than divides our country. <coughs> Now, I probably should put this slide at the end of my presentation to help us all sleep better, right? <laughs> so, I wanted to start my presentation with those poll results because it is so important that we learn to believe in the possibility of our democracy working. I'm embarrassed because I don't remember the exact name of the book, but I was discussing it with Randy earlier today. And I know somebody in here has a phone and they're going to Google it for me. But it was Madeleine Albright's book that came out in 2017. And in it, she details how a democracy breaks down and how a fascist re regime takes over. <laughs> And it's from her lived experience as a, as a leader and a diplomat. And she talks about how the first step is the polarization and the division of a society. And another critical step is the discrediting and the breaking down of any credibility of our institutions. And so, I really think 
we have to stand up for our democracy right now and we have to not allow ourselves to be manipulated into very destructive divisions. No, none of us will ever have complete and total happiness with every policy decision that's made. But democracy is about compromise, and it's about the will of the people. We, the people. And so we'll continue to do this survey at the National Collaborative every year, and we're going to do our very best to get it out into the public so that we, we affirm the possibility that we are more than the sum of our parts and that we are better than cable news and social media would believe us to be. What I want to talk about this evening is this work that's going on in the country called Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation. And I want to unpack it. Uh, the work began Oh, I guess I started doing this work back in the, maybe the 1970s. Uh, there was a K through 12 curriculum that we developed called Americans All. And we revisited the history of these United States from multiple racial and ethnic lenses. We gathered experts and scholars who authentically represented their own groups African American, Native American, Puerto Rican American, Asian American, Hispanic, Latino, and white Americans, European Americans. And we were the only so-called multicultural education program back then that included the white experience in the curriculum. Because we knew then that this wasn't about the other, this was about us. And what I learned over the years of working with thousands of educators was that the more we learn about the perceived other, the more we're able to individuate, the more we're able to have authentic personal interactions. And in that case, it wasn't authentic personal interactions, it was through their stories and through their history. What we saw was that the perceptions of the perceived other they began to change, and people were affirmed and humbled by what they didn't know, but they were invited into the conversation, and they were better able to relate to their students who were diverse. Back in the 70s, we had a terrible disconnect between a predominantly white teaching force and a growing and expanding students of color population. Now, of course, that hasn't gotten much better. And we, know, we knew that teachers were bringing into the classroom the biases that they had learned, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. And this was affecting student outcomes. So fast forward more years than I care to count. right? Uh, and I'm, we're still working to change all of this. Some people ask me, well, what really motivated you to devote your life to essentially ending racism, basically? Uh, and I'll tell you a couple of stories, because stories kind of pull us in. I think the main thing that catapulted me into a lifetime of work in health, ending health inequities and ultimately racism, was the experience of literally holding the deceased body of my firstborn child in my arms. And there's something about that kind of experience early in life that changes you forever. In my case, it cemented my commitment to life. It made me love life and want to do everything I could possibly do to assure that that didn't happen to other women and other families. 
and to assure that we all have the opportunity to experience the abundance and the beauty and the grace and the goodness of living full lives. Now I went on to have two other amazing children. Some of you may know of my daughter. She's famous in her own right. She travels around the country to, and speaks to audiences of a thousand or more people, and I'm just shrinking, you know, <laughs> in comparison. But she's the author of a best-selling book, a New York Times bestseller called The Sum of Us, and her name is Heather McGee. My son is an accomplished, amazing choreographer and dancer and artist. And he has decided that Austin, Texas is the place to be. I don't understand that, but, <laughs> but he lives in Texas. So even though the, my first experience, maternal health experience, you might say, ended in tragedy, I learned so much about what it took to have a very healthy pregnancy and to give birth. And much of my early clinical years was in partnership with OBGYNs, helping other women to have healthy babies. But an experience that predated that tragedy was when I first went off to an experience that was away from my home in Cleveland, Ohio. Some of you may know of Chautauqua, New York. Chautauqua is the arts encampment, and a lot of people just heard of it this year when that tragic violent act occurred. Uh, but it's been around for a very long time, and I was gifted with a scholarship to go there and study, because at that point in my life, I, I wanted to be an actress. And uh, so I was studying theater and voice and dance, and the high point of the summer was the fact that Paul Robeson performed on that stage there, the big amphitheater. And about three weeks before he was scheduled to perform, uh, the voice teacher came over to me, and there was one other black person on the campus in the city. And she said, Mr. Robinson, Mr. Robinson wants the black people who are here to perform with him, right? And so, can you imagine, you know, at age 15, I, I get a chance to share a stage with Paul Robeson? It was unbelievable. But during that summer, I had a roommate, and she was white. And we became the best of friends, and we had bunk beds, and we had meals together. She, her form of art was sculpture, mine was theater, but we really bonded. We were both from Cleveland, I was from the the east side where black people lived. She was from the west side where white people lived. Segregation was then as it is now. But on the last day, or a couple of days before the summer ended, I was walking home to this little Victorian house that, we, that was our dorm, and there was an ambulance in front of the house. And I ran, I picked up my pace, and I got there in time to see them carrying her out on a stretcher. And I asked the house parents what had happened. And they said that she had attempted suicide. Now, I never know, I'll never know if she succeeded or not, because back then you didn't talk about these things, you know, the, the wall of silence went down. But for some reason, I ran up to our room that we shared, and she had left a note for me. And the note read, my father, who by the way was a Cleveland police officer, my father has taught me to hate black people. And over this summer, I have learned that that is a lie. And I don't want to live like that anymore. And so early in life, this authentic friendship that I had across racial lines ended in a very tragic way. And I could tell other stories 
that I won't, but you can pick up any newspaper anytime or turn on the TV and you realize that these issues of hatred and racism are life and death issues. And we see what hatred can cause right now, today, in the Middle East. We see it in the South Sudan. We see it in Ukraine. We see the end, we see what violence leads to, and we see what hatred and the inability to love one another, how much harm it causes and how much needless suffering. So the work that I'm doing for the rest of the time that I'm gifted with the opportunity to live on this planet is to try and spread the word and encourage people to prioritize learning to love one another. Not in a romantic sense, but in the ultimate sense of our humanity, our shared humanity. So, this movement is happening across the country right now, today. I lead an organization called the National Collaborative for Health Equity, and we are funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to bring cohorts of leaders together and take them through an 18-month experience, an immersion experience they are already leaders. These young, young, and you know, it's a relative term, right? When you, when you live long enough, everybody's young, right? But, but they range from 21 to 60, you know? And, but they're doing work in their communities to transform their communities. Their work aligns with the pillars of the Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Framework, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit more. And the beauty is that the foundation is so generous, we're able to give each one of these leaders a $65,000 award, almost with no strings attached. <laughs> the award is given to them to support the creative work that they are doing. So we've just culminated our first group of 40 leaders. We are in the midst of our second group of 40 leaders, and in December we open applications, the call for applications for our third group of 40 leaders, and as I said, the experience lasts for 18 months. Now, I know many of you didn't know what Zoom was four years ago, but you know we lived on Zoom for much of the COVID experience, many of us did. And so it occurred to me that we could design a virtual experience, which would cost about a third of what an in-person institute costs. And so this institute, the Culture of Health Leadership Institute for Racial Healing, it is largely a virtual experience. People come together once a month virtually, and then they are gathered together in person once during the 18-month process. So I'm sharing that with you because when the applications, the call for applications go out in December, I certainly hope you'll have some young people, because I don't see a lot of young people in this audience, but, but all right, very good, very good. I was messing with you, now I know you uh, to apply for that. So, um, could we have the next slide, please? Oh, we're going to go into our video. So, what we're going to do now is show you a very brief video that describes some of this work that's happening across the country. All right, I should get out of the way. Thank you. 
a national grassroots effort to write a new American story. Ultimately, racism is a belief system. It's an ideology. It's a way of seeing the world. And it is the legacy of that belief system that we live in. The work has already begun. In small towns and city centers, media libraries, churches, and on college campuses from Alaska to Louisiana. How do we get over our fixation on this absurd notion of racial hierarchy? Since it was developed by nearly 200 experts in 2016, the Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Framework has been used by dozens of communities across the country with the goal of uprooting the conscious and unconscious belief in a hierarchy of human value. To craft the framework for local TRHT commissions, we drew on the study of over 40 global examples of truth and reconciliation commissions. The framework is simple but powerful, and it works. Truth, racial healing, and transformation guides folks through a process of learning and unlearning that ultimately creates a new community history, one that doesn't hide the ugly truth and weaves the stories of all local peoples. Over years of experience, practitioners have learned that relationship building by stakeholders in the community is an essential ingredient to overcome divides. On this basis of healing, through storytelling and understanding, community members collaboratively craft plans for creating transformational change to the laws, economic rules, and physical structures that keep us apart and unequal. Empowered by a national commission and fueled by grassroots energy, truth, racial healing, and transformation will help usher in a new America that lives up to its highest ideals. Where all of us can thrive. You're going to get us back into the slide? It worked? Work? Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, there it is. All right. <laughs> this movement, this truth, racial healing, and transformation movement, as was said in the video, was informed by an analysis of the over 40 truth and reconciliation commissions that have happened around the world that had happened at that point. This was back in 2017. And what we wanted to do was learn from the things they managed to do right and the things that they didn't quite get right. And so we created an approach to this that would take in the complexity of the diversity and the diverse history of our country and at the same time deal not with just, you know, a cathartic sort of confessing of, of wrongdoings, that sort of thing, as many of them did, but would actually deal with the structures of inequity that have been built into our society. But what I, what I, you know, when you get to be a certain age, you get to be maybe more bold than you were when you were younger, and I understand the power of belief. It is the way that we create our reality. It is the way that we actualize our dreams and our vision. If we believe it, some people say we can achieve it. And knowing the power of belief, we understand that it's not enough to put a Band-Aid on or to smash the Band-Aid off. It's not enough to change a law because the Supreme Court can come along and reverse that law. It's not enough to march and to demand our rights if America is to ever truly get over its legacy of a false ideology of a hierarchy of human value. That ideology has to be abandoned. That belief has to be addressed. And so some people who are who are younger and more angry, I, I, I've had my share of anger too and, and still have it, they say to me, oh, beliefs don't matter, I want action, 
I want laws changed. I want people prosecuted. Yes, we want all of the above, but trust me, if we don't get in there and change the belief system, if we don't say to America, you were built on this false ideology, just like at some point humanity recognized that the earth was round and not flat, we have to recognize that we share a common human ancestry. And these false taxonomies have no place in the 21st century. Now, another book I would highly recommend to you is called Differ We Must by Steve Inskeep. He's an NPR anchor. And he revisits the life of Abraham Lincoln. I'm on my second read of that amazing book because what he's doing is establishing Lincoln as a politician, as someone who knew the political game and knew how to play it and knew how to win it. But in one section of the book, he's describing the reactions of a legislator named George Pendleton when Lincoln was proposing that black soldiers be allowed to fight in the Civil War. He describes how they, they debated for several, several months what kind of uniforms would they dress these black soldiers in. Because they couldn't wear the same color uniforms as the white soldiers. And they finally realized that was ridiculous. There was too much risk in that. So they would let them wear the same uniforms. But Pendleton was concerned because if they were shot in action, right, Imagine they're on the field and they're stabbed with a bayonet or they're shot, that they would fall dead next to each other. And that couldn't be allowed. The white soldier and the black soldier falling dead next to each other in the trench. I had to put the book down for a few minutes after I read that section. But it shows how deeply held this false belief in racial hierarchy was, and in many places today, it still is. And that's why I say to you, if you don't take anything else away from my talk, understand the power of belief and understand that that's the work that has to be done. And we're gonna talk about how we do that. But this map is very exciting because it sort of summarizes the scale of the movement right now. And usually when I do this, if I had more time, I'd build it up gradually. But first of all, the good news is we have over 70 college campuses that have truth, racial healing, and transformation campus centers. When I first got the call to come and do this talk, my immediate response was, oh, they must be a TRHT campus center. Unfortunately, you're not, but I'm gonna say it yet, a TRHT campus center. But there are over seven. There are at least 15, maybe 16 local communities that have received funding from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and other foundations to build community coalitions that are implementing the TRHT framework. Con Congresswoman Barbara Lee and Senator Cory Booker and others in Congress have put forth a resolution calling for a national Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Commission. And in the years that we keep, re she keeps reintroducing that, we have gotten over 170 congressional co-sponsors, and I think the last count was 15 co-sponsors in the Senate. We have over 70 libraries in this country that have implemented the work through their Great Stories Club. And some of you may know that there are now over 300 local jurisdictions, public health jurisdictions, that have declared racism to be a public health crisis. And we are working with the American Public Health Association and the De Beaumont Foundation. And we put together a series of briefs that you can download with, at no charge, called Healing Through Policy. And what we've done is curate the work of local communities that align with the pillars of the TRHT framework. So I want you to leave here with the optimism of slide number one, 
and with the optimism that is expressed in this map, there is work being done in this country. It is not talked about on MSNBC. It is not talked about on Fox News, thank goodness. But that's okay. That probably means it's real, you know? <laughs> it's really happening. Next slide, please. Okay, so what do I mean by the TRHT framework? It's basically a strategy. It's a strategy that is broad enough to support local innovation, as is evidenced in that set of briefs that I just described that you can download, but it's specific enough to focus the efforts on doing the work that must be done. The first pillar of the framework is called narrative change. We know, some of you are social workers and psychologists, if you're in public health, you know that we as human beings are literally wired to listen to stories. Some people say it's as ancient as the first campfire. But when we hear a story, we lean in. And that story triggers our imagination to, to see pictures and to, and to project thoughts and ideas. Narrative and story is, is critical to shaping beliefs. And so the first body of work that a community or a campus has to focus on is what is our narrative of who we are? Where did that narrative come from? How did we get here? Our strategic partner in higher education is the, Associate, the American Association of Colleges and Universities. And they really um, have built this collaboration of over 70 college campuses that are doing the work. And every campus is attacking or is, is addressing narrative change in their own unique way. Some are, are working on curriculum modifications. Some are working on making sure that there, there are books that tell a, a more comprehensive story. Of, of our history, of the history of every discipline. When we started the work with narrative change, we engaged many of the leaders on the West Coast in Hollywood. Uh, and you can see some of the work that's happened since there, since then, over the last 10 years. There is much more diversity happening in, in the movies and in television. Uh, and that's an important place for the work. We work with local media. Uh, but narrative change is important, and this work can be done at an institutional level, it can be done at a community level, it can also be done at an individual level. What is your personal narrative? When have you had opportunities to, to connect with your true beliefs or to project out biases and, and prejudice on others? So narrative change is the first pillar. The second pillar is what we call racial healing and relationship building. And this is kind of my sweet spot in this work because I, I shared with you a little bit of the work in, with schools across the country back in the 70s. Uh, and there were many other programs that I designed over the decades, but basically I have seen what happens when diverse people are brought together and they're able to curate and to share honest stories that are focused on the humanity that they share with others. And so it's actually an approach that I've outlined in this book, Rx Racial Healing, which can be secured through the, through the American Association of Colleges and Universities. And the proceeds from the sale of the book, it supports the work on the campus centers across the country. Um, and I keep, the American Association for Colleges and Universities recently changed their name to the Association, wait a minute, yeah, they changed it from Association of American Colleges to the American Association of College, whatever, anyway, I, I, I mix that one up. But they are a wonderful partner. And um, what we've got are thousands of people around the country who have been prepared to co-facilitate RX racial healing circles, where people, diverse people are brought together. Because you know, 
we're still so divided and segregated as a nation that you have to be intentional about bringing diverse people together in a room. It doesn't just automatically happen. It does happen in many workplaces, but even when it does, if you don't have some intentional work to address prejudice and biases, you really don't get the connections that you need at the deepest level for the best work. So racial healing is an important part of the work. It is relational work. It is what, now there are many forms of it, restorative justice circles. Uh, many books are being written on the subject. Some, some communities are doing major book reads together. Uh, but the work is happening. And what I mean by racial healing is eliminating the belief in a false hierarchy of human value and replacing it with an understanding of our shared humanity and our common human ancestry. So, and then once we begin to tell a true story, once we begin to build the connective tissue and to galvanize the majority, and let's face it, we need a supermajority these days in order for this to work, then we have the momentum to address the embedded structural inequities. And we asked ourselves, here we are in the 21st century, and we are still acting out a belief system that was rooted, what, in the 15th and 16th century, in the 1700s? This false ideology of a taxonomy of the human family that puts white people at the top and people of color at the bottom? How on earth has that taxonomy and that belief system been sustained for all these centuries? And we came up with three primary vehicles for maintaining and entrenching that false ideology. And the first is through separation. And you know the myriad vehicles for separating people. Yes, redlining, residential segregation, reservations, the cradle to prison pipeline, the child welfare system, the list goes on at transportation systems, the design of transportation systems. It's all about separating. And as long as we stay separate in enclaves, we can hold on to our misperceptions of our humanity. Remember my friend from Chautauqua. The law, this ideology is main, has been maintained through a legal system that has be, been designed to reinforce this ideology. Most people think of the criminal justice system when we say the law, but one of our principal partners in this work is the American Constitution Society and we have attorneys general across the country who are re-examining many of the opinions and statutes and state governments that were embedded in and designed to perpetuate the false ideology of racism and racial hierarchy. Some people don't know that even Nazi Germany the leaders of that regime came to America and studied our racist laws and then went back to Germany and designed their approach. So this notion of the law as a, as a foundation of structural racism, it's real, it's not fake news, and it has to be addressed. And it is being addressed, that's the exciting news. And then finally, our economy has been fueled since our inception as a nation. Our economy has been fueled by racial hierarchy. Because more than anything else, enslavement and the taking of indigenous people's lands, this was designed to do what? To build wealth. So those are the five pillars of the framework. Narrative change, racial healing and relationship building, separation, law, and the economy. And communities, when they do this work, they form coalitions with representatives who have expertise in each of the pillars, and they come together and they engage in a five-step process that begins with imagining a future a future for their community,
for their institution, for the campus, for their workplace, a future in which they have overcome racism and eliminated the belief in a false hierarchy of human value. Now some folks, when you tell them to imagine an America in which racism has truly been put behind us, some people, particularly people of color, say, I can't do that. I don't believe America will ever do that. But we get them there, because you can't achieve it if you don't believe it. And so the first step in the five-step process is creating a vision of success. And the coalitions create a vision for each pillar of the framework. What is the narrative of our community when we've succeeded in doing this work? What do the relationships look like? How do we know that we've built the connective tissue across racial divides? How have we addressed the legacy of separation? How have we changed the laws? What, what are the new laws like that celebrate our equal value as human beings, that, that create equity? And how have we changed our economy? When we first did this work, and the committees worked for about, I don't know, about maybe eight months, and we put together this big report, you know, comm commissions always do, right? And we gave it by, we, asked, we did have to get it cleared by the law department at the foundation. And when they saw some of the recommendations for the law and the economy, they really were upset. <laughs> they were like, are you kidding? We can't support this. This is revolutionary. I kind of stood my ground and I said, well, we aren't saying this. The communities are saying this. And so we were able to keep the report in one piece. But this is how they sabotaged us. They printed the report in such pale ink. <laughs> it was a yellow cover with light gray letters. <laughs> Nobody could really read it unless you were determined to. <laughs> so I laugh about it now. I still have the report. But more importantly, we have the hundreds of people who did the work, who went back to their communities and did the work in their local communities. And, and you know, you really, you kind of have to push in order to get there. So this is the framework. Could we have the next slide, please? What? <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. Well, I do want you to understand what we mean by racial healing. And it is this, I, this, this getting rid of the idea of a false hierarchy of human value and replacing it with a deep embodied understanding of our connection. But that begins with loving ourselves because we can't give what we don't have. And so this work of racial healing is rooted in self-love, it's rooted in affirmation, it's rooted in a sense of belonging. And that deep, deep personal psychological work leads to a consciousness change that I have found is permanent. We can truly learn to extend grace and love to one another. So I can't believe that my time is, is up with all of you. I was determined that I was going to have fun with this audience and take my time and share stories. And it looks like I took too much time and shared too many stories. But I wanted you to leave here tonight understanding that this is the most important work of this moment that our democracy is at stake. And the way that we actualize the aspirational tenets upon which our nation was built, that we are all created equal and endowed by our creator with the inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that the way to actualize those tenets and make this very young nation's experiment in governance by the people. The way to do that is to learn from our past 
and not take its legacy into the future and burden our children with the false ideology of a hierarchy of human value. Thank you. We have uh, time for a few questions, if anyone would like to. Yeah. Hello, thank you so much for your talk. Okay, I have one question. Have you ever thought about mentorship as a racial healing and relationship building part of the framework? Mentorship? Yes, sir. Yes, in fact, some communities are doing that. I love that question. Uh, and, and, you know, that has been going on forever, but seeing it as part of the racial healing work, uh, the short answer is yes. And the key is an authentic relationship that transcends um, differences. Mentorship, um, doctor-patient relationships, um, many of the existing um, communities that we have, anytime people can come together and transcend these perceived differences purposefully and commit to authenticity in terms of, of you know, doing the work of looking at our narratives and building uh, connection, Yes, and I love that. We can put that under as one of the examples, mentorship for sure. Thank you for that. Good evening, so happy to have you with us. My question is, what can baby boomers do? You know, some of us look at it and we say, we've already done our thing for our lifetime. Someone is speaking as a baby boomer, what can I do to access and be a part of this and make a difference? Wow, thank you so much, my sister, literally, uh, as, as I too am a boomer. Uh, and but, from Ohio. And from Ohio, all right, there we go. <laughs> well, I think that the wisdom, you know, I, I believe it was Randy, Brandy, what did you say earlier today? You said that once we reach a certain point in life, we can share our wisdom because we have a we have well-earned perspective and understanding, right? And earlier in our careers, we were experiencing and developing those perspectives and wisdom, but now we have them. Uh, so we really need the intergenerational dynamics. Oh, we need it so badly. And, and the young people who are experiencing racism in ways that we didn't, you know, they're experiencing it in a, in, a, in a dynamic where they didn't expect it, right? Uh, in some cases, when we were growing up, we were trained to expect it. Many of the young people today were not, right? And so when it hits them upside the head, they don't know what to do with it. And this is when the intergenerational relationships can be so helpful and so important. Uh, but there is work happening in Ohio right now, uh, and I would advise you to follow up with me if you're personally interested in getting engaged, because we can connect you with people around the country who are doing the work. Uh, and maybe there's something even more creative that can grow out of this discussion. Maybe we can have a special group of and seniors who are available to, to support and to engage with the younger generation. But this is all of our work, and I am convinced that there's a certain, um, I don't want to use the word wisdom, because it's overused, but there's certainly an understanding and a, a truth that is evidenced by our lived experience that can be of great value uh, in this work. So thank you very much for the question. And the National Collaborative for Health Equity.org, it's nche.org, right? Yeah. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, and we can connect you for sure with some of the communities around the country. There's some exciting work happening. Yeah. Do we have time for one more? Or more than one? Cool. Thank you for your presentation. Um, as an international student, uh, what opportunities do you have available? And have you considered using that same framework outside of the US? Thank you. Um, we have, you know, I, I think, I don't think that this, that our leadership program is, is close to international students, but, uh, but I don't want to misrepresent that the, the opportunities are cl clear in the application. But I think it's open for international students. Uh, and yes, in fact, I'm doing a talk this Friday uh, at the request of UNESCO. Uh, and I will be presenting this framework. I've done a couple of talks with uh, international or global groups, uh, in particular with a group of attorneys that were working on transitional justice issues. And, and I presented the framework. Uh, and when we first started the work, we, we put, at the Kellogg Foundation, we did do a, a huge investment, I think it was 25 million, actually in Brazil, but this goes back almost 18 years. Uh, and one of the things that happens if the work isn't done with the right spirit, um, what you end up with is a really strong backlash, and you know, it fuels what, in some cases, we're even seeing in this country. Uh, but yes, the short answer is it was informed by the work, transitional justice and the international truth and reconciliation efforts, and we see it as a, as a global uh, effort. And in fact, my daughter and I are now uh, working on a book together that, that looks at and pulls the lessons from the global efforts, both those that were undertaken and those that were not. So yes, thank you for that question. All right, any one last question? I can't get too close to the speaker because I'm, I'm causing the feedback. All right, well, right, first of all, thank you very much for this. And before you go, we have a, a parting gift for you. Um, the title of Honorary Professor in the College of Public Health here at ETSU.